official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official should not be this, this warm in basically November. That's not good. All right, so uh, for everyone in the class, what's on the agenda? Again, project three is out. We do it on November 17th. We've announced on Piazza, or we will, we'll announce on Piazza. We'll have the recitation this Monday coming up at 8 p.m. because Tuesday is supposed to be an off day for everyone. But then homework four will be due uh, this, this November 3rd coming up, okay? Any questions about project three or any questions about homework four? The question is, does Project 3 depend on Project 2? Uh, there is, you have to do index scan and an index nested loop join that would use your B plus tree. If you can't make it concurrent, just put a, put a fat latch on top of the whole thing. Right, that'll just protect it. it like, and then I don't, I don't remember what the, the leaderboard is, but like, uh, that, that, that'll be sufficient to get for correctness. Okay? All right, so, uh, where are we at in the course? So we made it to the top. Like last class was about query optimization, right? So we now know how to do query planning. Like now we know how to take requests from the application, to, you know, for SQL queries, convert it into uh, to, a, to a physical plan and e execute it. And we now know how to execute whatever the operators we pick, how to access the data, how to manage memory coming in and out of disk, right? How to organize things on disk. Like so, at this point in the semester, you you can build a end, full end-to-end -end database system. Yes. Hey, Christian, you haven't co covered the parsing part of the query. Uh, I don't care about that. Uh, no, no, no. So like, there are like that's a solved problem. There's open source libraries to parse SQL. Do, just use one of those, right? There's there's SQL parse in uh, in Rust. There's libpg query libpg query in for C plus plus or C. Just use those, right? It's taking that AST, binding it to, uh, to object IDs in the catalog, and then running through the optimizer. Yep, that's the hard part. So where we need to cover now, though, right? yes, we can build a database system that can run queries and store some data and return results. But we haven't talked about what happens when the thing crashes. How do we make sure we, we don't lose any data? Or what happens if we have two queries trying to update the same thing at the same time? What do we do? So overarching across all of these, these different layers is going to be what we're talking about for the next three weeks is the concurrent mechanisms, which we'll start with today. How do we make sure that transactions or queries are updating things in a safe manner? And then there's the recovery piece, which we'll cover in, in two weeks. Uh, and that is like, if my data system crashes, how to make sure that I don't have any corrupted data, I don't lose anything, right? Because again, if you start, you know, what, what good is a database if you write things into it and then it just crashes or the system restarts and you lose everything? That would be bad. And the reason why I'm sure showing these as, as these, these layers that are uh, overlapping with all the other parts, because as we see as we go along, that all the design decisions we'll have to make in our different layers have to take into account in t you know, what concurrency protocol we're going to use or how we're going to do recovery. Like your buffer pool manager needs to go back and says, okay, well, what transaction updated this page? Is the log record for that page written out the disk yet? If yes, I can evict it. If no, I have to wait. So the additional logic in the eviction policy we didn't talk about because we haven't talked about logging yet and recovery. So that, that's what we're going to head into now. Okay, so uh, let's, let's talk about a motivating example of what transactions look like. Let's say we have a really simple application uh, that, that it's the ATM at your bank. And you basically, the logic is somebody wants to take out some money. You got to make sure they have at least have that enough money that they want to take out, take it out of the account, pay it out, basically transfer it out to somewhere else, and then write back into the database and say, okay, they took out this, this amount of money, right? So you can sort of think like the application logic would be like this, but the steps we would do it in the system was that we would read the, what the current balance is for A, check to see whether it's sufficient funds. If yes, then we can go ahead and pay out the $25 or transfer $25 to somewhere else. But then now we got to deduct the, the, the amount we took out to our new balance and then write it back to, to the database and update the, the state, All right? So this is sort of a high-level operation that you would want to do in your data system. Like before we were talking about like these are SQL queries. It's sort of thinking like even more high level than that. Like here's, this is some piece of work I want to do to perform some operation. And it may compri be comprised of, of multiple queries or additional application logic. All right, so the first problem we got to deal with is 
Well, what happens if we crash here, right? So we checked, we read, read the bank account balance, we had $100, took the money out, uh, transferred somewhere else, but then now we crashed before we wrote it back, right? So at this point, what should the state of the database be? Right? Should it be the $25 I took out? Is, should that be accounted for? Right? Well, say, say instead of pay $25, I put $25 into somebody else's account. Right? Are they going to have the $25 and I'm, all, and I'm still going to have my $100? That would, be, that would be bad. Right? Because we, we end up losing data, corrupting the database. Well, let's say we have another situation like this. So say you and your, and your best friend share accounts for some weird reason, right? And you both want to take out $25 at exactly the same time. So the logic here is going to execute it twice and say like two different workers or two different machines. It doesn't matter. So you're both going to read the balance. Yep, we have $100. Uh, so we go ahead and take the $25 out, transfer it out. And then we go ahead and update the new balance. We have $75. And then at the exact same time, they both write it back to the database. Is this correct? No, right? Because now like, there's a magic $25 that went missing from the bank account because uh, two people try to write back to the same thing at the same time. Right? Individually, they were correct. Right? They did all the right steps. Check to see whether I have you know, sufficient funds. Yes. If yes, take the $25 out, transfer it somewhere else, and then write it back out. But concurrently, or running simultaneously, then we have this weird effect where money went missing, and that's bad. So how can we avoid this problem? What's that? He says use a write latch. What, write latch on what? On, on A? His question is, is there a way to do that? Yes, we won't call them latches, we'll call them locks. But that, that, you, that is one way to, to solve that problem. That's the, next, that's the next class. So what if we did something like this? What if we just said that we don't allow queries to run simultaneously or transactions to run simultaneously at the same time. That we have some kind of queue, uh, a single queue, and one worker just pulls out one transaction at a time, one piece of work at a time, executes it to, to, to completion, right? And then when it's done, then it's allowed to go execute the, ne the next thing in the queue. All right, that solves the problem of, of, of the second example where I had two guys simultaneously trying to update the same database, the same record. Right now, that won't happen because only one thing can run at a time. That's essentially the right latch that he's proposing, the right lock. Right? It's a single thread execution. But now, what about the problem I said before, where the, in the first example, where I, I did an update and then I crashed before I was able to get the money back to the account? Well, what if I did this? What if I, before any transaction starts, that I pull out of the queue, what if I just take the database file, right? assume it's a single file or directory, it doesn't, it doesn't matter and I make a complete copy of that data. Then have the transaction operate on that copy, and then when it says, okay, I'm done, done all the work, I just now flip a pointer to say the, the, my copied version is now the new version of the database. So any, but any other transaction that comes behind me will look at that new version, and then I'll, I'll discard the old version later on. If the transaction fails for some weird reason and we come back, well, we just see that we have this, this copy that we've modified, but we never actually fully saved it. So we, had to, we need to go ahead and just ignore it. So is that correct? Well, that, uh, that would avoid update problems? Shaking head, yes. Is it a good idea? No, why not? Well, the, the parallelism is, is Say it again. The parallelism is he said the amount of parallelism is, is, is basically zero. Sure, but it's correct though, right? And a lot of, in most cases, uh, any two transactions don't actually share data. He says, uh, in most cases, two transactions don't actually share data? Yes, you can just paralyze them that without. He says that you can paralyze them because, um, I would say that a lot of times in, in transactional systems, there's a, there's, there's a hot set, a working, and that's like, think of like when you go to like Hacker News or Reddit, you post comments on like whatever's on the front page, right? Everyone's trying to update that one, like the small set of things. So that usually there's a hot set what everyone's trying to update or modify, right? Uh, the example I used to use give was like Taylor Swift's t Twitter account or Justin Bieber's Twitter account. Like those would be, they would actually run on separate machines because they would have so many people trying to update or read it at the same time. So usually there's hot records that everyone's trying to modify. Uh, 
so it's not always true that they that every transaction would be uh, d you know, t touching distinct things. He said, she says it's not scalable. Correct. Yeah. So if your database is 10 megabytes, or say the smallest case, four kilobyte page, sure, no big deal, right? Copy it, do, do whatever you want, write it back. If I got one petabyte of data, then I don't want to be copying one petabyte every single time. Now, there are some file systems that allow you to take, uh, like an XFS, you can take uh, Delta snapshots or copy and write snapshots that are really fast. But in general, this, this, this is not going to be a good idea. All right? So this would be correct. But it, and some systems will actually will do this. The, one of the first systems, relational data systems, system R, they did this. It's called shadow paging. We'll see this in a second. Uh, but as, you know, it has a lot of problems that we'll, we'll cover as we go along. So the problem we're trying to solve today is that we want a better approach than just having transactions run one at a time. And we want a better approach than having to make an entire copy of the database as like a shadow copy or, or like a... Like a a dirty version of it, we're going to avoid all that extra overhead. And what we want is we want to allow transactions to run concurrently and be clever about how we interleave their operations, their queries, so that we can maximize parallelism, but still also ensure correctness. Right? All right, it's pretty obvious that we'd want this, right? If, if we have one qu transaction that blocks it has to read something from disk or write something from disk, we can let another transaction run at the same time. Or modern CPUs, they have a lot of cores. We want to, you know, we want to be able to utilize all of them. We'll see in some cases, some systems like SQLite, they'll allow multiple readers, but they only have one writer at a time. And that makes certain things a lot easier. Uh, but in systems like Postgres and MySQL and pick your favorite you know, uh, transaction data system, they're going to allow multiple transactions to run at the same time because you just get better performance. So the way to understand or sort of state, set up the problem we're trying to solve today is that we want to allow this arbitrary interleaving of operations, and I'll, I'll find what they are in the next slide, uh, but think of these reason rights. We want to arbitrarily allow them to, 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 to run simultaneously, but be, be smart about how we schedule things so that we end up with a state of the database that is correct. And I'll put big, big quotation marks around correct because that can mean different things for different people. But today we'll talk about serializable, or serializable scheduling. And that'll be like the gold standard to say, this is, this is, this would be equivalent to if I ran it in serial ordering. But we'll see next class, most systems don't actually do that. One important thing to understand though, is that when we talk about transactions today, that the database system can only control or only has purview on the things that it can do on behalf of the application. And that's just end up being reads and writes. And that means that we could define a transaction that could do a bunch of steps for us. But then if the application says, OK, in the middle of that transaction, let me send an email confirmation to you, right? But then that something happens and the system crashes. We've got to roll back our changes. And we've got to run that transaction again. Because that email step is not controlled by the database system, we can't roll that back. So we can only, the only system can only control whatever happens inside of us. If someone does something on the outside, like launch a missile, we, we, we can't stop that. So we need a way to define what it means to be correct and to determine whether, when we start interleaving these operations within transactions, whether that's a valid thing to do or not. So for today's class, we're going to talk about the database in, sort of in a, an abstract manner. Uh, and we're not going to talk about tuples. We're not going to talk about tables. We're not going to talk about any other things you have in a database system. We're just going to say that we have objects. Like we're just going to A, B, C, D, and so forth. Right? It doesn't matter how, you know, what it actually is. All the algorithms we'll talk about today and, and going forward will still work no matter what the size is. And obviously, if the smaller you make it, the more parallelism you have. Uh, but there's more overhead in maintaining and tracking who has what or, or who's doing what. For today's class, we're also only going to assume the database is fixed size, meaning we have a fixed number of objects at the very beginning. And any operation, write operation, is just going to be updates. So we're not, do, we're not doing deletes. We're not doing inserts. Those are called additional problems for us that we've got to cover next class. So then now we're defining a transaction, again, in the con in the, in the, within the scope of a data system, we're just going to say our transaction is going to be a sequence of read and write operations on these objects. All right, I'm not saying whether they're SQL queries. I'm just saying like I'm reading something, and I'm going to write something. I'm, going to, I'm just going to overwrite the, the, whatever the current value is. Transactions will start with this explicitly with this begin command. Uh, in some systems, you, if you just write any one query, that's all, it's sort of implicitly there's a begin and commit at it, uh, around it. It's called auto commit. But for our purposes today, we'll assume that there's explicit begin that says when a transaction starts. And then the transaction ends 
when either the application tells us that we commit or roll back. And then we'll see this next class. Just because you tell the system, I want to commit, doesn't mean you're actually going to commit. And it's not until you get the acknowledgment that, that you know the thing's actually been saved. Because in some cases, you may say, I want to commit. And the data system is, no, 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 you're not doing that. And it actually kills you. Right? And it's, and it's allowed to do that according to the sort of programming paradigm that we're going to expose. So again, today, we're just going to focus on doing reads and updates, no inserts, and assuming the data is, is a fixed size. And then we're going to have explicit begin and commit commands. All right, so the way we're going to determine whether a schedule of, trans of transactions on our data system is correct is going to be through this notion of, of, of this acronym called ACID. Quick show of hands, who here has heard of ACID before? All right, half-ish, a little more half, right? And so this is, a, this is a acronym that was developed in the early 1980s uh, by this German guy, um, and it basically stands for atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. So atomicity is going to mean that all the operations within my transaction have to occur, or none of them occur, right? all or nothing. Consistency is a kind of a weird one, but it basically means that if my transaction does consistent things and my database starts off in a consistent state, then when that transaction runs, the database will be consistent. All right, well, that's kind of fuzzy too, right? Uh, we'll cover this in more details later on, but it, this will make more sense when we start on distributed databases. Basically, if I have do an update on this one machine, and I have data replicated on other machines, if I say this, this transaction commits, if, I have the, if I'm providing consistent guarantees, if I immediately try to read that thing I updated on another machine, I should see that exact value, or see the correct value. The truth is, the, guy that, the German guy that kind of tried to came up with this acronym, atomicity, isolation, durability, this makes sense in transactions. He kind of shoehorned consistency in there to make the acronym work. And then also the joke was apparently he was trying to make fun of his wife because his wife didn't like sugar. So he's like, oh, she's an acid woman. So they added, so she got, he, he wanted to make sure he got consistency in there. That's what the book says. I, I, I've never met the guy, so I don't know if that's true or not. All right, next one is isolation. This will be really important. We'll focus most, mostly on this today. This is just saying that a transactions will execute uh, under the illusion that they have exclusive access to the database and they're isolated from all the other transactions running at the same time. And that means that we don't want to see any intermediate updates from transactions that may have run at the same time that we did. And the durability one is pretty obvious. It says, if my transaction commits, the data system tells you that it's committed. But then if the system crashes, and when it comes back, you should be able to see your, your changes. All right, so today's class, we're going to go through each of these one by one. And again, this is just sort of the high level concepts. We're not really talking about any specific implementations or algorithms you would, you would have in your database system to actually support these things. That's what we'll cover uh, starting Monday's class next week. And then today also, too, we have uh, a guest speaker from Firebolt. Um, last class, or last week, we had ClickHouse, which I thought was a really great talk. Uh, Firebolt is actually a fork of ClickHouse. Right? So they took ClickHouse, they forked it, rewrote a bunch of stuff. Then they got one of the people out of Germany to go do a bunch of rewrites. Uh, and they've, they've sort of diverted from being pure ClickHouse anymore. Uh, so he's going to talk about the, some of the stuff that, they, that they're doing. Okay, so we're going to go through each of these one by one. So again, atomicity. Again, either all the operations are going to happen in the transaction or none of them. Right? So there's basically, when you, when you say a transaction is going to run, uh, there's going to be two possible outcomes. That all the operations will commit in the order that the transaction specified, um, or it either gets uh, aborted by the, the application saying, I, you know, go, I, I don't want to do what I just did, roll back the changes. Or you go to try to commit, and the database system says, no, you're not allowed to commit. I go ahead and kill you. So it's the database system's job to make sure that all these transactions are atomic, right? And it's not something you specifically have to worry about in your application code. You just know that like, if I get a transaction in my, if I set up a transaction in my system, I should expect uh, my operations to be atomic. So there's two basic approaches to the guarantee atomicity. And again, we're not going to go into too much details on what these are. We'll cover these uh, in, the, in the following weeks. The, the first one is the most common one, like logging. And it's unfortunate that the term logging is used typically like for debug logging, like when you print out print statements uh, when your application is running to try to figure out what's going on. Um, but a logging would be a, a way to keep track of, like, here's all the operations my transactions made while they're running, and I'm going to write them into this almost like a ledger, if you will. And that actually be, can be maintained separately from the database itself. Or if you remember log structure merge trees, right, all the update operations, were just, that, was, that was in this log. Same, same concept, same, same idea. Um, 
you can think of this as like, again, the black box of an airplane. So like if I crash, if an airplane crashes, they go find the black box that records all, the, all the steps the plane was doing right before the crash. Same thing here. If my, if my do a bunch of operations, my database, I go ahead and commit, uh, and I know my transaction sh should be saved, uh, and all the effects should be atomically persisted, then I, when I look at my log, I'll see all those updates, and I can replay them to put me back in the state I was before. So I don't have any uh, loss updates. As I said, mo I mean, nearly every single data system today is using uh, some variation of logging. Uh, f you, you get better performance in some cases. We saw this in log structure merge tree because I can turn all my random writes into sequential writes. Uh, and then also for audibility or recoverability, it also is super helpful for that. The other approach is what, what I talked about in the beginning, this thing called shadow paging. And my, my sort of straw man example was the extreme case where I copied the entire database into a shadow copy and then make any changes that I want. Uh, typically, you would do this with, with, at a page level. So anytime I try to update a page, then I make a copy of that page in, as, in the shadow space and then apply my update. And then when I go and commit, I just make sure I atomically install all those new pages into, uh, into the database system. And as I said, this is what IBM first implemented in the 1970s. Uh, then they realized it was actually a bad idea for performance reasons. You basically have a bunch of, you have to run defragmentation on your, on your, um, on your pages because now all the updates, uh, now you end, end up having holes in your space you got to reuse. And it made sequential scans really bad. Few systems actually do this. Uh, CalCB and LNV are, are probably the two ones that are the most famous. I think CalCB is still doing this. I might be wrong. Tokyo Cabinet was a key value store out of Japan. Uh, but I, th I think that's been replaced by a Kyoto Cabinet. It's much faster. And I don't think that's a shadow paging. So again, I, I need to explain this to say, that, hey, this thing exists. But of course, I got to say, don't do this. All right, you always, always want to use the logging approach, either with heap with a right head log or through log structure merge trees, which we, we've already covered. OK? So one advantage you'll get, though, from shadow paging over the logging approach is that recovery, like when after a crash, is instantaneous. Because again, all you have to do is come back, and then you immediately have this consistent or this correct state of the database. Because any changes you made from any transactions that was running while the system crashed made a bunch of dirty, you know, modified some dirty pages on the side, and you just ignore them when you come back. So if you care about recovering really, really fast, uh, then you want to use this. Right ahead logging is, takes some time. You got to replay the log, and depending on how fast your disk is or how often you take checkpoints, which we'll, we'll cover later on, uh, it might be okay. But if you need to have instant recovery because you expect to crash all the time, you'd want this. Another system, I don't know the name of it, that did this back in the 1970s was, uh, you know, it is in the news, uh, but from Puerto Rico. So the Puerto Rican power company built their own specialized database system that did shadow paging because in the 1970s, they would have power outages all the time. And so if you're having multiple power outages throughout the day and your database is going to crash, when it comes back up, you want your database to be able to recover right away, not to wait hours you know, every single time. So they, they did something like this. Because right, they, they knew they were dealing with that, with that environment. Again, we'll, cover, we'll contrast the, the shadow paging and right head logging, and we'll have a whole class on right head logging uh, in a few weeks. All right, so the next, next one in asset is consistency. And as I said, this is kind of a fuzzy thing that says, like, if, if the transaction is correct and the, the Davis is correct or consistent, then when I run transaction runs, it should be correct. And the application has to then tell the data system what it means to be correct, and you do this through integrity constraints. Right? You can add uh, check commands when, in your, when you create table statements, or you can add constraints after the fact. Like if nobody's age can be negative, uh, then you, you add those integrity constraints. And the data system will, will guarantee that no transaction tries to run to insert someone with, with a negative age, because it'll violate that constraint, which puts the database in an inconsistent, cor incorrect state, and, it, and, and rejects the transaction. Right? So basically, the data system is going to guarantee that all the integrity constraints will be tr are true or satisfied before a transaction runs and then after a transaction runs. And typically, it's done on a per query basis. Like you can defer your, your consistency checks to the very end. Like you, you say, I'll let anybody do anything. And then only when I go ahead and commit, then I check to see whether I violate things. Because maybe you could batch things up. But as far as I know, most systems will, as soon as you do a query to update something, they'll check the integrity constraints. 
You may have heard of the term eventual consistency, especially in the context of distributed systems or uh, NoSQL systems. Again, we'll cover this later on, but it's basically what I said before. Like, if I have now my database uh, copied across multiple machines, if I have strong consistency, then when, I, when I, my transaction updates the, the database on one, one node, and I go commit, and the database told me, yeah, your data is committed, then immediately if I try to read that record on another node, I'll see that my update reflected. Eventual consistency says that eventually your updates will get propagated. So I could do my update on this one node, commit, and then I read that, try to read that record on another node, and the update hasn't arrived yet, uh, so I may see an older version. Or I may see multiple versions, depending on how, how it's actually implemented, if you're using vector clocks or not. So again, this is, this makes, because this makes more sense on a distributed context, uh, but like, you know, we'll, we'll cover this in way more detail in near the end of the semester on lecture 23. Right, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about how to use Paxos or Raft or two-phase commit to guarantee strong consistency instead of measurable consistency. Okay? All right, so now, again, as I said, isolation is the big one we want to spend most of our time talking about. So, what we want to have is our database system provide this abstraction where transactions can run and the, the application doesn't have to worry about is it going to see funky or un weird data that it doesn't expect to see from other transactions running at the same time. So we want to provide the illusion that, that any transaction that's running has dedicated access to the database system and it's running by itself without any other transaction running at the same time. But as I, we said in the beginning of the class, we want to allow transactions to run at the same time because we'll get better parallelism, right? So a way we're going to achieve this concurrency is by interleaving the reads and writes on the database, database objects that we talked about before in transactions. But then we still want to have the database state end up to be as if we executed the transactions one by one or, or, or in a single file. So the concurrency of protocol that, that we would implement in our database system you ever heard of two-phase locking or OCC or optimistic concurrency control? That, that's what these are. It's going to be a, an, an algorithm or, or implementation in our system that is essentially going to be like the traffic cop in our database system to, that gets to decide what transaction gets to run at what time uh, and in what order. And for their individual operations, what are they allowed to read and write to? All right, and, we, and it's going to come up sort of to dynamically generate the schedule to say, okay, here's the things that you're allowed, to, here's the order I'm going to execute things to, again, to try to avoid the problem of transactions or the, the, the database ending up in the state that would not have occurred if I, if I didn't execute them in serial order. So, again, we'll spend all the next week talking about these two protocols. Uh, so, the first one would be pessimistic uh, concurrent control. And this is basically saying before a transaction allowed to do something, I'll check to see whether it's an okay thing to do, and I'll block you if it's not, or I'll abort you if you can't do that. So you're trying to avoid problems before they occur. Optimistic occurrence control protocols will be, I assume that I'm not going to have any problems, so I'll let this do, people do whatever they want, the transactions do whatever they want, I'll keep track of what they do, what they read and write, and then when they go to commit, then I'll check to see whether it, you know, allowing them to run was the right thing to do or not. So Monday's class next week will be on pessimistic protocols, and then... Wednesday's class next week will be on optimistic ones, right? And then most systems you implement just one or the other. All right, so let's look at an example here of why this matters. So assume we have uh, two accounts, A and B, and each have $1,000 in them. So the transaction we want to run, uh, we want to run two, two transactions. The first transaction wants to transfer $100. So we take $100 out of A's, A's account and put $100 in B's account. And right? I'm showing sort of simple procedural logic here. And then transaction two wants to compute 6% interest on the bank accounts and update them. So now the question is, if I have these two transactions and I can interleave them in any possible way that I want, what are the possible outcomes that I could have for T1 and T2? Right? What, what would the possible outcomes of the state of the database after I run them? Yes? The question is, do we assume that incrementing by 100 is atomic? No, we'll get that in a second. So what am I doing here? I'm reading A, then writing A. We're not going to do that. We've got to read A, that's one operation, then write A, it's another operation. 
So there's a lot of different outcomes we could have, right? Because, I mean, it's not infinite, right? Because there's only uh, you know, four operations per transaction. But we know that if we want the state of the database to be as if we executed T1 followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1, then no matter what, when we add up the, uh, the two bank accounts and compute the 6% interest, the final result of the total amount of money that sh should be in this bank, assuming it only has two accounts, should be 2120. Right? So this is going to be a mind trip for a bit for, for you, but like from a database systems perspective, what we're, we're allowed to do is that no matter whether T1 is submitted first followed by T2 or T2 first followed by T1, we're actually allowed to order, execute them in any order that we want. If you cared about making sure T1 executes first followed by T2, you either have to do this in your application code, like have a queue that, you, that the application then send a request, or there are some systems that provide a stronger level of, of, of consistency guarantees. Something like, if you ever heard of Google Spanner, right? they provide what's called external consistency. Like, what they'll guarantee is that the order you submit it is the order that things will commit. But most systems don't do that. Most, systems, and most, most applications don't, don't even need that. So this can be a, a, a little trick that we can have that we can reorder things any way we want, but all, at the end of the day, all that matters is that we add up the money and put 6%, uh, compute 6% interest on it, the, the final sum is 2120. So the two legal outcomes we have is we execute uh, T1 first followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1. And again, it doesn't matter of, of what the final state is for A and B, as long as, again, A plus B at the end of the day is 2120. So what does that look like? So I would have, uh, if I execute these in what I call in serial order, so this is an execution schedule. So you see I have a begin, then I have my, uh, my a, a equals A minus 100, B equals B, B plus, plus 100. In this verse here, I execute T1 first, followed by T2. In the other example here, I execute T2 followed by uh, T1. And in both these cases, even though A and B have different values, again, if I just add them together, then I'm guaranteeing 2120. So, so this is a serial ordering, right? That I can execute T, you know, one transaction at a, at a time. But then now if I want to interleave them, and again, we talked about why we want to do this, right? We get better parallelism. If one, one transaction has a block because there's a miss in the buffer pool, right? Another guy can keep running, right? This is all fine and dandy. But now I've got to be careful about when I want to interleave things that I don't violate or I don't end up with the state of the database that would not have occurred if I if I had executed them in serial order, either T1 followed by T2 or T2 followed by T1. So if I go back here, right, now T1 starts, takes the money out of, out of A, but then for whatever reason it gets blocked, right, because of page, you know, page miss or whatever, and then T2 starts running, and then it computes the interest on A, then there's a context switch back over, T1 starts running again, adds $100, it go, goes ahead and commits, and then T2 starts running again, it then adds the interest to, to B, and it goes ahead and commit. Again, in this example here, even though I'm interleaving the transactions, it's equivalent to one where T1 executed first followed by T2. And the key thing to point out here is that we're, we're making sure that any operation, any update operation on T1, on A and B, happens before the, the operation, uh, another update operation on that same object in the next transaction. Yes? Right, so the question is, why are we defining the, that they're equivalent based on the, with the, the, the total sum of, of this and not the actual values A and B? Because what I'm saying, in, in this programming model, we're allowed to inter order things any way that we want. Right? So it, as long as the, the, the state of the database is equivalent to executing, uh, executing one of the transactions in a serial order, in this world, that's okay. And that's different than maybe what you're, what you're used to in like parallel programming, okay, like in like C++ or Python or whatever you're using. But in our world of transactions, that's okay. The reason why we want to do this is because it's going to open up a bunch of opportunities for additional parallelism that we would not be able to get. And again, at a high level, this is correct. But it's a, it's a you know, different idea of correctness. 
So if you look at this example here, all right, this is example, a bad interleaving. I take $100 out of A, then I context switch and now execute T2, then I compute interest on A, then I compute interest on B, then I now go switch back over and add $100 back to, to, to B, right? The end state here is not equivalent to one where I would execute them in a the serial ordering, right? Because if I add, them to, add the two numbers together, now I get 21, uh, 2114, and I'm missing $6. And if it was a bank, you'd be pissed, right? If it's your money. Right? So, what he was sort of asking before, like, can I assume that these, this, the A equals A minus 1 or the B equals P plus 1, is that what the Davidson actually sees? No. Right? What you're really seeing is a read on A followed by a write on A, and then a read on A, write, read on B followed by a write on B. Right? So that's how the Davidson can reason about uh, these operations. It doesn't know the high-level semantics about what the operation is actually doing. It just knows that you read something and then you wrote something. We'll see later on. If we do know whether, uh, we, do, we, we can somehow infer the semantics of what the, of the transactions are actually doing, we can actually get even better parallelism, but that's impossible and nobody actually does it. But we'll, we'll see that later in, in this class. So now the question is, all right, sort of, it's sort of easy to see from us just looking at this whether this, this schedule is correct, because it's only two transactions. They're doing pretty simple things. And I, I just sort of add the numbers together. But this is obviously, this would not be scalable. And this wouldn't actually work in a, um, in a full, you know, in a, in a real system. There's a lot of transactions. So we need a better way to figure out how to determine that these are, these are equipped. Uh, this is okay. So the goal we're trying to figure out now is can we look at a schedule and say, is this going to be equivalent to a schedule that would, that would, that would put the data in the state uh, from a schedule that executed in, in serial execution order? So this is just re-implementing what about our re, uh, repeating what I've already said. So a serious schedule is one where we don't we don't do enter interleaving with different transactions, and we're going to say again two schedules will be equivalent if the end state of the database will be equivalent to we executing the, the the first schedule and the second schedule, assuming they start at the same database state. So the thing that, that the, the the gold standard or the isolation level that we're going to want to support is called serializable, uh, serializable uh, isolation or serializable schedules. There is actually a higher level of serializability, uh, and that's that strong serializability, strong consistency I said, where you guarantee things are executed in the order that they arrive. But again, most systems don't give you that. Most people don't need it. So a serializable schedule is going to be one where it'll, it'll, it'll be arbitrary interleaving of operations and transactions that put the database in the same state as if it was in uh, executed in serial ordering. So this is a, this is a bit different than, than again, what you may be used to in, in, in programming in other contexts, right? The, the correctness is not gonna be based on the, things, the time that things arrive, or actually in some cases, the time that things commit. Because your transaction may say commit, and then the order that it gets committed is not the order that it arrived, and also not, not the order that it executed. That's kind of funky. But again, because we can play around with, this, with these games about how we're going to order things in our database system, we're going to get way better parallelism than we would if we just have a single, single queue execute things one after another. Question. Yes? Could you give an example where the order of transaction doesn't matter? You said, can, can I give an example where the order of the transaction doesn't matter? Uh, I mean, the bank account one I just gave just now. It doesn't matter whether T1 executes first by T2 followed by T2 versus T1. It doesn't matter. It's t the, the end state of the database is still correct because it's equivalent to executing things in a serial ordering. If I, if I wanted to make sure I did the transfer first followed by computing the interest, then you have to do that in your application. You have to tell me to execute T1, and then only when T1 comes back and says, I've committed, then you execute T2. The data system can't do that for you, though. Spanner can, but most systems don't do that. All right, so now we, gotta, we need a way to formally define, okay, how do we know whether two schedules are, are equivalent, right? And we kind of intuitively saw that what had to do of the, the ordering of the operations of when we read and wrote objects to the same object across different transactions. So we're going to define this as conflicts between transactions in a schedule if they do some kind of operation on the same object. Either one, 
Either one does a read and a write, or one does a write and a read, and they're from different transactions running at the same time, and they're, on, they're touching the same object or objects. All right, so that'll be the notion of a conflict to say that these things can't, can't be equivalent or can't, we can't interleave them. And then there's going to be now different anomalies that can occur based on the comp type of conflicts we can have in our schedules. So you can have a read-write, a write-read, and a write-write conflict. Why no read-read conflict? It's fine, because if you read the same thing and I read the same thing, not a conflict. All right? So I'm going to go through these three examples in more detail. I'll just also say there's two other types of conflicts that we're not going to talk about today called phantom reads uh, and write skew. So we'll talk about phantom reads next class. It's basically if I scan some data, I don't see something, someone's inserted something in between that, that range, and I scan it again, and now I see it. But now we're talking about aggregations, right, and not, not simple rewrite operations. So we'll see that next class, how to fix that. Uh, and then write skew, what we'll see uh, in two weeks, we'll talk about multi-version control. It's basically, I read the Davis at the same time, everything looks okay, and I'm up writing things, and it, it's not equivalent to the serial ordering. That does not make any sense. You'll see this later on. All right? Again, we'll, we'll cover this in lecture 17 and 19. But today's class, I want, I want to focus on, on the, the basic three. All right, the first one is on repeatable reads. These are read-write conflicts. And this is where a transaction will get different values reading the same object multiple times while it's running. So T1 starts, reads A, and say it gets back $10. Then there's a context switch, T2 starts running, it reads A, gets $10, and then there's some logic that says, if my account has $10, give it $5, make it $15. And then now it writes it back into the database to go ahead and commit. Now when T1 runs again, instead of seeing $10, it sees $19. Right? And again, if I was executing in serial order, T1 followed by T2, if I read A twice, I should get $10. But because I interleaved the second transaction, it was allowed to make that update, now I'm getting, what, again, what is called an unrepeatable read. I'm, I'm reading the same thing and not getting back the value that I saw before, which should not occur if I was executing them, in, again, in serial ordering. So this is a problem. We, we, we want to make sure we avoid this. Yes? The question is, what if we moved in the commit on the second transaction? Like, so basically, if I put this down here, again, this depends on, on the implementation of the data system, which we're not talking about just yet. You would have to make sure that this thing, that th this write is, is either can't occur because this guy holds a lock for it, or this write occurs in a private workspace that, that this guy can't see, and you hide it from him. So the locking will be next class. The hide it from you will be Wednesday's class next week. But I'm trying to deal with the intuition and not actual implementation. But you can kind of see how we can start doing these things and to protect ourselves. Because then we have to worry about deadlocks, too, if we start worrying about locking. Again, we'll cover that. All right, the next anomaly is a write-read conflict, also called a dirty read. And this is where a transaction is allowed to read something from uh, a transaction that hasn't committed yet. So we read A, get $10, write back $12. This guy then reads... Uh, a sees twelve dollars, which again it should not have saw, if uh, if they were running in true serial ordering, right? And then it writes back whatever fourteen dollars, whatever value, value you want. But then now later on T one aborts or rolls back. So that means we got to undo the change we made in, in on A. But wait a minute, T two read it and already committed, and we told the outside world, yep, we got your change. But you, again, the logic could have been, if my bank account has $12, make it $14. And that would have not occurred if, the, again, if you were running in serial ordering. So this is the problem. We, we can't allow this. All right, and the last one would be the write-write conflicts or loss updates. And this is where, when we have a one transaction overwrites a, an, an update made by another transaction, that shouldn't have occurred. So again, T1 starts with write on A, T2 then starts, writes $19, and then for B, they put in Bob, and then when this comes back over, now does a write on B and puts in Alice. Right? This should not occur because it either should be $10 Alice or $19 in Bob, but in this schedule here, we have $19 in Alice, which again, would not, cannot occur if, they were, if it was running in a true serial ordering. Does that make sense? All right, so now, we know how to, we know how to identify the conflicts, uh, but how do we know 
again, for any arbitrary interleaving, how do we know whether it's actually equivalent to uh, serial ordering? Or how do we know our schedule is actually serializable, as we, we, we would say? So to do this, we're going to go ahead and check this, whether our schedules are, are correct uh, by looking at the conflicts. Uh, in, in today's class, this is just understanding the, 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 again, the theory behind it to understand what correctness actually means. In a, in a real system, you would actually not have, going back here, you would not have the schedule ahead of time in most systems. Because right? think of how this would work. In your application, you call begin, you, write a, you send a query, get some data back, goes back to your application, then you some, do some more logic, and then do another query. Right? So the data system doesn't see, here's all my reads and writes ahead of time. It, says, it sees one read, one write, back and forth. So things are coming in uh, incrementally, and you, you wouldn't be able to maybe figure this out. So the protocols next week will be, how do I do this in a, in a dynamic environment to keep, make sure that you don't, you, know, you, don't violate these, you don't hit these anomalies? Today's class is really saying, OK, if I look at a schedule, if I know all the, the operations ahead of time, how do I know whether it's, it's correct or not? So now, this, gets, this is also going to be a little bit weird, because now we're talking about two different levels of serializability. There's actually more. Uh, it's in the theory, uh, the theory world. We don't care about that. Um, but there'd be the notion of conflict serializability and view serializability. In most database systems, if they support serializable transactions, some systems will lie to you. Oracle does this. Uh, some systems, if they, if they support serializable transactions, you're getting conflict serializability. View serializability is a, uh, no systems can do this because you have to understand what the application actually wants. But it, I'd like to present it to you guys in class because, again, it's a different way to think about correctness and show that there's opportunities to get even better parallelism you could get using two-phase locking and, and MVCC and OCC we'll talk about next week. But to do that, you've got to know what the application means when it says, do something for me, which is, you know, is, a, is very difficult to do. So again, most systems, when you say, I want serialized transactions, you're getting complex serializability. Again, in Oracle, if you say, I want serialized transactions, they say, yep, no problem, but it's really a lower isolation level. And it's been that way since, since the 90s. And they don't care. And again, most people may not care. All right, so we're going to say now, on a, on a conflict serializability, that, that two schedules will be conflict equivalent if and only if they are uh, they're, they're multiple transactions touching the same, same objects. And then the, the ordering of the conflicting actions, like a, like a read-write, write-write on the same thing, that they're going to be ordered in, in the same way. So then we can say a given schedule will be conflict serializable if it's equivalent to some serial ordering. All right, well, this is kind of vague. What, is it, you know, this, what does it actually mean? I'm being kind of hand-wavy here. How can we actually determine this? So to do this, uh, a really simple algorithm is to generate what's called a dependency graph. So the idea here is that we would have in our graph, uh, a node for every single transaction that's running in our schedule. And then we would connect an edge between them if the one transaction is, is doing an operation on some object that conflicts with the other transaction. And then that operation appears in, in the schedule before the other conflicting operation from the other transaction. So in Wikipedia or the textbook, they might call this dependency graph, but the, the idea is the same. So now to determine whether our schedule is conflict serializable, so equivalent to a, a serial ordering, that as long as our dependency graph doesn't have any cycles, then we know that we, we, we're not going to have any conflicts or have any issues or any of no, the anomalies I talked about before. So let's look, look at this example here. So I T1 followed by T2. T1 writes on A, reads on A, and then writes on, reads on B and writes on B, and the T2 is going to do the exact same thing. So we can just sort of go down one by one, and for every single operation, look across to see, do we have any, any conflicting operations? Again, we're one. Uh, it's either a read followed by a write, or a write on a write. And then the operation T1, or the one transaction, occurs before the other one, the conflicting operation in the other transaction. So in this case here, we do a write on A followed by a read on A. Right? That's a conflict. So we would have an edge from T1 to T2 on A. We have a read on A on T1, but then we do a write on uh, a on T2, but the read occurs before the write, so there's not, there's not an edge going in the other direction, at least, at least on A. But then now we have this write on B in T2 occurs before the write on, sorry, the write on B occurs before the read on B uh, in T1, so then now we have an edge between T2 and T1 here on B, and then now we know we have a cycle on a dependency graph, and therefore this schedule will not be, uh, it's not equivalent to a uh, ser serial ordering. Right? All right, and the high-low intuition is that the, the output of T1 depends on some, T2 doing something. 
And the output of T2 depends on T1 doing something. And therefore, we know that this, this cannot occur if they were executing in serial ordering. All right, for two transactions, that's pretty easy. Let's see how to do this in now in three transactions. So again, so first we start off with uh, the read on A occurs before the, the write on A. Uh, so that's a pro so that's, we have an edge there. Then we have now the write on A occurs with the read on A there. So we have an edge. Uh, that's an, another overlapping edge. The write on A occurs before in T1 occurs before the write on A in T3. Now we have another edge going on there, but that's a repeat. We do a write on B in T2 followed by a read on B in T T1, so the edge going there, right? And then we have the write on B followed by a write on B. That's not a conflict, right? So th there's no edge there. And then we're done. So is this equivalent to a serial ordering, or serial, serial execution ordering? Yes, because there's no cycle. Right? So it's equivalent to T2 followed by T1 followed by T3. Right? Can you think, sort of think about it like, all I care about is like, you know, what's, what's in the, my end state. I had the write on B. That's good there. Uh, so I, the write on B from here. Uh, or sorry, the T2 executes first, right? So that happens here. Then T1 executes, that's there. And then T, T1 ex T3 then executes, right? So the T2 followed by T1 followed by T3. Again, so in this case here, remember I said, even though uh, the transactions may have started at different times, I'm going to commit them in the order that, that guarantees that they're, they're, the things are serializable. So T3 is going to run after T2 even though the begin command started before T2's begin command. And that's OK. So let's look at another example. So again, now we're going back to doing more, uh, the, the more complex operations. So now we, have the, we intermix with the, the object code. That's why the procedural code. But we still have the read on A followed by the write on A. But now we see like A equals A minus 10. Like that's going to happen outside the database. And that's like we take a local variable and make a change. All right, and then now in our T2 transaction, all we're doing is computing an aggregation, like the sum of all the, of the values uh, for the accounts in A and B. And then there isn't a command to, to print in SQL uh, like this. And just echo just means I'm going to spit out the, whatever the final result of the sum is. All right, think, think of returning the value of the sum. All right, so now if we do our analysis, again, we have a conflict between uh, T1, T2 on the write on A and read on A. So we have an edge there. But then we also have a, a write on A. And then, uh, uh, what is this? Right on A. I don't know why there's two edges there. Ignore that. Uh, the read on B, follow the read on here, here. And now that's going back. Now we have a cycle, right? So this example here would not be equivalent to a serial ordering under the, under the definition of conflict serializable, right? Because we have that cycle dependency graph. Yes? This question is, what happens if another transaction, one of the transactions aborts? So say this guy aborts here. Uh, under this schedule, what would happen is you would read the write from the, this guy. T2 would read the write of A, and it shouldn't have read it. So therefore, it, if, even though it aborted, I still have that cycle, and I have to, I, I have to roll back both of them. Your statement, if, if T1 reads A twice, yes. uh, so it reads A, and then T2 writes A, yes. and then T, T1 reads A again. Uh, and T2 aborts. T2 aborts. Roll back, and then T1 also reads A again. So let's not get into, like, if you call abort, how, like, what does that rollback actually look like? Just take it, like, in your example, yes. Like, if, if I call it abort and I roll back the change from T2, and then T1 reads it again, and it would see it would see the previous value. You're correct. That would be that's okay, and it wouldn't get picked up in the dependency graph. Assume that for all, just ignore whether aborts are going to roll back or not. Just take it for the what, what are the operations that I'm doing, and then I fill my dependency graph based on that. Yes. Why is there a dependency from WA to RB? This this is a mistake. Ignore that. Yeah, get, get, get rid of that edge. I'll fix that later. All right, so in, yes? Why is reading before writing a problem? Why is reading before writing a problem? Uh, because if this thing, if this thing should have, uh, 
if this was running in true serial ordering, then, then this thing should have read, read this update, and it didn't, right? So it, it read the first update, there's an edge there, and then it doesn't read the next update. So it, 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 it should either read both updates or none of the updates, and it read half of them, and that's, bad. that's wrong. All right, so is there a way we can modify or change this, what this application code is doing? to still be correct, even though it's not conflict serializable, even though we're still going to have a dependency graph? Well, what if instead of, uh, instead of just adding the sum together and printing out, what if I just go check to see whether the, the value inside of it is greater than zero, greater than equal to zero, and then I just increment the a sum or the count of the number of counts that are greater than zero? So the logic has changed. I'm, I'm, like, the, the previous one was, was computing the, the aggregate sum. This is now saying, give me the count of the number of counts that have more than, more than uh, zero. Assuming all the counts are with, you know, have more than zero, that even under this ordering, this, the, with this interleaving, this count would always still be the same. Right? Assuming all the values, all, all, all the values have enough that they take $10 out and it, it doesn't cause any problems. And the count is still going to be, still gonna be uh, the same. Even though I, this is not conflict serializable, if my logic looks like this, then it actually is equivalent to a, ser to a serial ordering, even though, it's not, uh, even though I'm interleaving. So this is what view serializability is. So it's a more broader definition of serializability, where if, if you understand the semantics of what the application actually wants to do, then you actually can interleave things that you would not be able to do under conflict serializability. All right, so there's a former definition here that we don't need to go to. Right, about, about view equivalency. It's just saying that, again, if, if, you, if the final value of, of, that comes out of the transactions is equivalent to one where of, of, a, of a serial ordering, even if the, the operations actually should not have occurred because they conflict, then that's OK. So my, maybe this example is a bit difficult to understand, but let's look at a, really, a much more simple one. So I have three transactions. T1 does a read on A, write on A, T2 does a write on A, and T3 does a write on A. So these are called blind writes in, in transactions. So if I just write to something without actually ever reading it first, it's, a, it's, called, a, it's called a blind write. Right? You, you're, you're updating something without actually looking at it first. So again, if I now build my dependency graph, I would have a conflict on T1 followed by T2, uh, and then T1 followed by T3, going back to T2 to T1, and then from uh, T2 to T3 as well, right? Because again, they're, 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 reading, they're writing things that they shouldn't be allowed to write. And then additional one between T, T2 and T3. But if I look at this schedule, the only thing I care about is what's the final value of, of A. And in this example here, it all, all it matters is whatever T3, T3 wrote to it. Who cares whether T1 read something and wrote something, and whether T2 read, wrote something as well? I'm basically don't you know the end state of the database is just whatever this last guy wrote is what what survives, and that's the only thing I care about. So this would be equivalent or view equivalent to a schedule where T1 executes first, followed by T2, followed by T3, right? Because again, the only thing I care about is who who last wrote to T3. So view equivalency is going to allow for all schedules that are conflict serializable, as well as additional view serializable schedules, in particular the ones that do blind writes. Because you, you just don't care. So, I mean, this is, defining this more, uh, more formally, is just trying to say that, again, like that there's, if you can support view serializability, that you can do, you get more, better parallelism because you can understand what the application actually wants or the meaning of the transactions themselves at a higher level. But that requires you to basically do some kind of static analysis or, or talk to a human, which is the worst thing to do, to say, is this actually OK or not? And so that's why no system actually supports this. Yes? Oh, sorry, can you switch to the, this one? Um, so if someone reads after T1 commit, uh, but before T2 begin, it will actually read the commit value by T1. But for the first schedule, it doesn't work like that. So. Does that not break uh, the equivalent? So your question is, if there's another transaction that reads, reads what, T1's A or T2's A? Yeah, if um, it reads A 
after, so for the actual serial life school schedule, if it reads after T1 commits, but before T2 begins, it will read whatever that T1 writes. Correct. But for the schedule on the left, if we read it like at the approximate same uh, position, it's actually not going to read the value that T1 writes. So does that break uh, equivalency or no? Uh, for, for serial, for, for conflict serializable or view serializable? So the question is, if I have another transaction, let's say, that does a read in between T1 and T2, does it write anything? No. Then, uh, let's see, how would that work? So if you're, so it would be basically reading right here? Uh, before the delete. Before, the, like reading here? Yeah, yeah, somewhere. Uh, that, if, it, if it just reads, that would be OK, because it, it would see the update by T2. No, so you would have it. You would have it be. Uh, you would have it be. Say this is T four. You'd have T one, T two, T four. Then sees the write on, on T from T two, and then T three commits. That's okay. But that, that would have that would certainly have conflicts. In that case, because it's just a read, uh, and there's, it doesn't do anything else after that, it, it actually wouldn't introduce a, a, a cycle in the dependency graph. Um, but just going back here, like the, this thing has, like, without that additional thing, you, have not, you already have a cycle, so it doesn't matter. That you, you wouldn't, this would not be a complexizable schedule. But yes, you could introduce a read like that, it would, it, was, it would work. All right, so a better way to think about all this sort of isolation levels and, this, and scheduling stuff is you can sort of think that this, this space here is all possible schedules you could have for any possible ordering of, of transactions. They're doing anything in your database. And then a small subset of this is going to be the serial orderings. But then around that will be the conflict serializable schedules, which includes, you know, which is a superset of the serial ordering. And around that is the view serializable ones. And like I said, there's additional ones after uh, that go around the view serializable ones, but we don't, we don't care, about, care about those. And we'll see next class when we start talking about, like, Cascading imports and other things. There'll be some schedules that will be another category of schedules that will encompass view serializability, conflict serializability, and serial scheduling, but also some, some non serializable schedules. So, in most systems, again, when you call serializable, you're going to get this, this, this boundary here. And we'll see next class how, how do we actually enforce that. All right, to finish up real quickly, I'll talk about transaction durability. Uh, Again, we're going to have a whole lecture on write-ahead logging and, and checkpoints and recovery. Uh, so there's not much to say here. But it's basically the things I said at the beginning of the class is that we need to make sure that if a transaction commits and we tell the outside world, the data system tells the outside world that your transaction has successfully committed, then if there is a crash, then no matter what happens, if they come back, they should still be able to see their changes. Right? You can have even stricter levels of durability, meaning if I, if I crash and then the machine catches on fire, or the data center burns down, then if I have really strong uh, durability guarantees, I still see my data. How? Well, you have to have backups on, on you know, another data center, another machines. Right? Again, but we'll, we'll cover how, we'll, we'll see how we handle that later on. But the basic idea is going to be the logging and the, and the shadow paging, and we'll see how to make these run fast uh, in a few weeks. Again, so going back to our, our asset acronyms of all these different properties, right? You can think of like the atomicity and the durability. Are we relying on the redo and undo mechanisms in our data system? So like the, the, the write-ahead log will give us redo. The shadow paging stuff will give us undo. Uh, write-ahead log gives us undo as well. The consistency models will be guaranteed by the integrity constraints and additional consensus protocols like Paxos and Raft that we'll see later on. And then the isolation stuff will be handled by the concurrent show protocols like two-phase locking and OCC that we'll see starting next week. OK? All right, so again, hopefully this is again, just a quick crash course brain dump of like, here's the high level of things that we're going to start talking about now when we talk about transactions. What does it mean to be correct? What does it mean to have serializable, uh, serializable isolation? Um, and again, there's another good example of why you don't want to, in your application code, you don't want to write a bunch of database-like stuff yourself, because this is really hard to do. It's really hard to get correct. And you want to rely on an existing data system that already has a battle-hardened concurrency protocol and recovery methods or protocols Im implemented, and not you winging it, like using MMAP or something stupid like that. Right? 
And so there was a phase about 10 years ago during the NoSQL movement, if you ever heard that term, where all these guys were like, hey, transactions are a bad idea. They're slow. We don't want to do them. Who is the big people? Who is the, can I, can I name the one company that was probably the most, the biggest proponent of this? Mongo, Mongo came before Mongo. Google. Well, that came from Google, yeah. But LevelDB was a single node uh, storage manager. But Google built this system called Bigtable, uh, right, which is still around. And they were like, oh, we don't need transactions on this. It'll run faster. It'll be more web scale and so forth. Um, and, but then Google wrote a paper, uh, a paper on Spanner, which is a you know, very famous transaction system, uh, about 10 years ago. And there's this little blurb in here that says, uh, it's, we believe it's better to have application programmers deal with performance problems due to overuse of transactions and then have, have you know, how to make those things run fast rather than everyone writing a bunch of code to deal with the lack of transactions. So basically saying, instead of having your rando JavaScript programmers have to figure out how to deal with inconsistent data or incorrect data because your system doesn't run transactions, you're better off getting people like Jeff Dean, give them a lot of money, really, make really, get really smart people in a single room to make the transactions run fast as possible and deal with the people... Uh, you know, deal with people's performance issues that come up, right? Because that's going to be way more, way, way more productive for the company, for the organization, if you have the system for transactions, because you don't have to write additional repeated logic over and over again to deal with bad data, right? So all the NoSQL systems, he mentioned Mongo, Cassandra, uh, CouchDB, uh, there was a bunch of systems... Actually, Couch2B does, I think, just for transactions. But all the systems that made a big deal about, oh, we don't support transactions. Look how web scale we are. Guess what? 10 years later, they all added transactions. All right? Because these concepts are super important. And it's, it's a, it's just, from a programmer's perspective, it's way easier to deal with uh, if you can assume the database is running, your transactions are running in serial ordering. All right. So next class, uh, we'll talk about two-phase locking, which is a pessimistic concurrency protocol that we'll, we use to, to provide or guarantee the ordering, the serializable ordering of, of transactions. And those are isolation levels, which will be the sort of dirty secret in, in all this where I made a big deal about how important serializability is. And then we'll talk about protocols to, to, to guarantee it. What well, turns out, most systems don't actually even support this or even give it to you by default. By default, they're going to give you a lower isolation level where some of those anomalies I talked about will, could actually occur. And does it matter? Nobody knows. All right? So we'll cover that next class uh, and, and, see, and we'll open up Postgres and see, see what it does. Okay? Any last questions before we finish over to Firebolt? Yes? Is it uh, necessary for like, OLAP systems to have transaction features? His, his question is, uh, do OLAP systems often have transactional features? Yes. Why is it? For, especially the question, why? For like bulk updates, right? Uh, oftentimes people want to, like you, you, uh, you upload a bunch of data, uh, and then now you have maybe corrections for it, and you make sure that happens atomically. But this system that does not really support the transactions. So question, this question, are there systems that don't support any transactions? Uh, I mean, yeah, there's tons of them, right? Uh, like from, from OLAP and OTB, operational side? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Um, i trying to think of the most famous one that doesn't. Um, I think CouchDB might support them now. Um, even DynamoDB from Amazon, that for big the longest time, they were like, we don't, we're not doing transactions. They now have transactions. Uh, what they do is slightly different. Where they, so I may have said, I, like, most systems don't see the schedule ahead of time. In DynamoDB, you sort of run your, your transaction first. It doesn't actually update anything. It just watches what you do, gets all the reads and, gets your reads and write operations, and then submits that to the database system, and then now can actually figure out the schedule of things. Um, FaunaDB is another system that does that, but most systems don't, don't work that way. But yeah, there's... I'm trying to think of any offhand, uh, but like pretty much all the major OLAP systems, they'll all support transactions. Uh, any the key value stores, uh, and now most of them support transactions. But you can you can build larger transactions around them, and we'll cover that later on. Okay, so let's see if the Firebolt guy is here. Okay, I, I wish you didn't say it's folk of click house. It, this it was it's not, true, not though, the right? best way to describe us. Wait, what? What would you say? I said, I wish you didn't say, didn't characterize Firebolt as fork of ClickHouse. This is just like, I don't know, 10% of what Firebolt is, but I, I, it's okay. It was, so it was originally a fork though, right? Like, because uh, I remember when, when the, the web page came public a few years ago, I was like, they do this, 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 this. I'm like, how the hell did a brand new startup have all these amazing features? Uh, 
and like they've only been around for two months. I mean, you guys have rewritten a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm not trying to belittle the work. I'm just saying that like the, the, the oh. provenance is, all right, sorry, go for it, your time. Some subsystems for fork of ClickHouse, others for fork of other systems, but doesn't matter. Anyway, so my name is Moshe Posumansky and I represent Fireball. By the way, um, can, can you switch to the slides? I think I'm sharing. Oh, you see? Okay, just I don't see it. Okay, I'll go. So um, let me start my timer. <laughs> so I represent Firebolt here, and we thought for this presentation we will go and uh, talk about something related to the stuff uh, you guys learned recently, last week and this week. Unfortunately, I thought this week you're going to learn about uh, Query Planner. Uh, otherwise, I uh, would have talked about Transaction Manager and Firebolt, which I think is very interesting, but hey, maybe next year. So um, rather than going into breath and talking about architecture and so on, we thought we'll spend a little bit more time on one of the aspects of Firebolt and hopefully you can connect it with the stuff that you were learning. So even though I'm presenting this, uh, this is a joint work of many others in Firebolt, so they should get their credit. Uh, before we go into the subject itself, let me set up a context and talk about what Firebolt is and what is it for. So our slogan is, it's Cloud Data Warehouse for Data Intensive Applications, which sounds like some kind of marketing slogan. So let me break it down for you. First of all, it's Data Warehouse. So it has typical Data Warehouse features like columnar storage, vectorized execution, uh, Postgres compatible SQL dialect, um, obviously, you know, transactions uh, we use uh, optimistic concurrency control on VCC and snapshot isolation as a default isolation level, and so on. It is also run in the cloud, so it has all the typical cloud features like two separation of storage and compute, um, multi writer architecture where any node in any cluster can update any data if it has permissions, of course. Um, since we are talking about analytical data volumes, it's distributed execution engine. Uh, so all the typical stuff. So the more interesting aspect is the second one for data intensive applications. And what we mean by data intensive applications, like user facing applications that you will run um, in the browser or uh, in mobile device, something that um, you know can have low latency and by low latency, I mean tens of milliseconds. Uh, our fastest non-trivial production query is five milliseconds and high concurrency, and by high concurrency, I mean thousands of QPS. And again, this is typically, like even a single node MySQL can handle it uh, on relatively small data volume, but we're talking about analytics. So we're talking about tens of terabytes. Um, we have customers who are beyond petabyte scale. And like data warehouses today are very capable, can do many things, but serving user-facing applications is something that they cannot do, and this is what Firebolt is trying to do. And we kind of joke that, you know, we, we want to be faster than Blink of an eye, and here's a graph to prove that we really are. Um, although we're using median latency, which is a little bit of cheating, but hopefully the point got across. So how are we able to do it? Like, it's not like we have some magic wand. Uh, so it's hard to, to achieve all those properties, but there are a few things which are working in our favor. And most importantly, if we're talking about supporting of applications, there are a few things which are fixed. The workload is fixed. It's predictable. There are tens or maybe hundreds of query patterns, but it's not like you see completely different query pattern every time or, you know, schema changes are infrequent. Usually, um, if workload or schema changes, it means new version of application get de deployed. Um, we also deal with read mostly queries. We do support updates and again, that's why transactions are important. It could be bulk inserts. It could be also point GML updates and deletes, that's fine. Uh, but the volume is not uh, that big and usually happen on fact tables and not on dimension ones. So um, since we have those things that are helping us to, to achieve this low latency and high concurrency at scale, and there are few techniques, uh, some are classic ones like indexing, which is uh, well known. Uh, just, you know, your workload, you build indexes for it. 
others, I thought you will talk about cost-based optimizer today, so I just wanted to say, uh, like, the biggest problem of cost-based optimizers is cardinality estimates and how they're propagated. So we use history-based optimizations instead. So rather than trying to guess all the cardinalities, we just look at query history at every stage, what actually happened, and feed it back to the planner. But today, uh, so there are quite a few of those. Today, we are going to talk about sub-result caching country use. So let me break this uh, into its component. First of all, caching country use. W what is it? So as we mentioned, uh, our workloads are very predictable. Uh, you know, the query patterns are very stable. Doesn't mean we're seeing the same queries all the time, uh, but the same pattern. So most of the query stays the same. Some element of it changes, maybe filter condition, maybe something else. But the rest of the query stays the same. Again, this analytical system, the queries are kind of complex. They can have uh, many joints and window functions and whatnot. Um, so obviously, if you have something which repeats over and over again, caching is an obvious solution to go to. And caching, of course, is ubiquitous in software in general, in databases in particular. And um, there are different forms of it. Buffer pool, you can think about it as caching at the scan operator level at the bottom of the query plan. And then many systems do full result caching, which you can think about caching at the top of the plan. But of course, you know, one may wonder why not to cache anywhere else in the plan. And this is what we mean by sub-result caching and reuse. And it, even though this has been researched, like first papers about it showed up in the 80s, and there are more recent ones that we put here, it's surprisingly rare in real systems uh, to do it. But Fireball does it, and that's what we're going to talk about. So um, that was caching. What do we mean by sub-result? So to explain this, uh, let's pick this made up example uh, of query on top of TPCH schema. There are a couple of joints here, three tables, two joints, one aggregation. Let's take a look at how query plan of it looks like. This is the query plan, exactly what I just said. Three scans, two joints, one aggregation. By sub-results, we mean two things. One is output of any operator uh, can be cached and you know, if it's on the top of the plan, it's the final result. If it's in the middle, it's sub-result, okay? Pretty straightforward. But also some artifacts of the operators, not the final result. For example, hash join builds the hash table that it's going to probe into two. So it's a perfect target for the caching. Like, it's not final result, but we still call it sub-result caching, okay? Okay. Um, well, how it works in practice, like a little bit more details. So we rely on planner to insert what we call maybe cache operator, which tells us what are the good points in the plan to do caching. It's called maybe cache because runtime doesn't have to produce cache. It looks at some constraints, like it doesn't want to, to add caches which are too big or violate some other settings that we have. That's why it's maybe. Um, the interesting thing that um, with vectorized runtime, it's relatively cheap to do those caches because vectorized runtime works by passing blocks between the operators. So caching really means just don't throw this block away after you're done with it. Store it somewhere. So it's cheap to do. They still take memory, of course. Um, um, but that's why it really works well um, in this setup. So let's take a look at uh, how this works in example of our query. So the same query plan, here planner decided to put maybe cache operator at the top of the plan, so it's full result caching. And also both join are going to store their hash table. So we run this query, it has to execute everything. And there are three things stored in fire cache. When we run this query second time, of course, the maybe cache is on the top and we already have results for it, so we had to do nothing. Okay, so this is like full result cache, kind of trivial, straightforward. Let's make it a little bit more interesting. So now query changed. So we added filter to it. See a filter on the orders table, um, which is the biggest table here. And now plan looks different. We pushed filter all the way down to the scan of orders. So we can no longer reuse the cache for the entire query because it's different. Um, and left side changed. But the right side didn't change. Right? It's, this filter doesn't affect nation and customer dimension tables. So we don't execute the entire 
write subtree, and we don't rebuild a hash table for the second join. So this query is still much, much faster. I think it's like five times faster on execution. Another example, so which can change query in other ways. Let's say we wanted to compute average, and for whatever reason, we said sum divide by count instead of AVG, or maybe planner decided to write it like that. So in this case, it's different query, but now planner notices, well, there is kind of um, it's low cardinality, like the, you know, there are only in the result will only have few rows because nation is a small table. And this final projection to do division actually keeps the cardinality. So maybe it's better to put maybe cache below it. And it's indeed was smart decision because all the plan below it is exactly the same as we saw before. So this query will also work very fast, even though it's not identical to the original one. So this is basically the idea. A um, few other things, um, obviously, like with any other cache, we need to think about cache eviction. And the most obvious commonly used policy LRU turns out is not the best one. The best one is to look at cost benefit. It was described in the papers. We tried out different ones, and paper was right. Uh, so basically, you say how much benefit you get from it, and you estimate it by looking how much time you spent executing the subtree and how much it costs you, like how big the cache, how much memory you're spending on it. And you take both of those into account. And in our experiments in real production, we saw that it can be up to twice as more effective as a simple LRU. OK, how does it actually work in real production with real customers? So we get, in general, we get 10x saving usually sometimes even more. And then it sounds like a good number, but we actually think we can make it much, much better because right now our planner is too conservative with putting maybe cash. So we think we can, like some calculations show, we can go to 100x or maybe even higher. Uh, and here we can see it's uneven. Some customers enjoy more than 95% of saving and some enjoy less and we need to work on that. So, um, this is what we have. There are still plenty of open problems. Uh, where exactly to put this maybe cache operator? This is, uh, we talked about that we use history-based optimizer. So obvious solution is to go look at the history, find common subplans, put maybe cache there. This becomes multi-query optimization problem, um, experimenting with it. It also requires our planner to do some scary non-intuitive things like Pushing down predicate is such a common rule, but it may destroy your caches if it goes too, too deep, like if it went to the our right subtree in our example. So sometimes maybe planners should pull up predicates instead, which does sound scary, but can have great benefits. Also, the way we def design our data structures, even though we aim to be fastest, we don't design them for speed, we design them for, uh, for size, we say, OK, if I can design hash table, it's not the fastest hash table, but it takes 10 times less memory and actually build uh, something like that. Uh, it will still be net benefit to our system uh, because we'll be able to fit 10 times more of those hash tables and uh, serve more queries from the cache and so on. So and by the way, if those problems and many others sound interesting to you, here's a link to our open positions. And this is the end of 10 minutes. Okay, uh, any questions for Moshe? Yes. So in the case where everything is cached, do you have any statistics on like what percentage of the stuff is actually used and what's not overall? So his question is, uh, in the case, do you have any statistics that you keep track of like what percentage of, of, of the items in the cache are used versus not used? Well, so we right now constrain the amount this cache can take because there are other things which are like, especially in vectorized execution, I think we're going spending about 20% of our RAM on those caches. Still, I mean, that's a big cache, right? These boxes are running with a lot of, lot of RAM. Yeah. Another question, yes. How do you determine what sub-result of what operators are cached? The question is, how do you determine what sub-result of what operators are cached? Yeah. So it's a little bit of heuristical now. So the, the way we go about it, uh, 
all the hash tables are cached and we'll also put maybe cache at the top of the plan and see how much down we can push it as long as it goes to cardinality preserving operators. So as I hinted, it's not as aggressive as it could be. You probably can do better. Yes. All right, so yeah, so I, I, I want to not backtrack what I said, but like, yes, Firebolt started off as a, click, a, a fork of ClickHouse, but as you talk right here, they've rewritten everything, uh, as far as I can tell, over the last couple of years. Uh, and so ClickHouse doesn't do this caching stuff that they're doing. And one of the reasons why they can do all this cool stuff is because it's a cloud system. You see all the queries, so you can, you can see what the workload looked like across all your customers. You can identify what are the ways to, to optimize them. Uh, and th you know, this caching stuff is, is a big part of it. Um, and again, it's awesome to think about, like, we took what we talked about last class, like here, here's how to build a query plan. And she showed basically that query plan, it looks like everything we talked about before. Now you inject this caching piece that doesn't change anything about the query plan itself, but now you, you're reading stuff from, from the cache and the query still produces the same result. This is why relational model and why SQL is an awesome idea, because you can do all these tricks and the, applica the application doesn't change any of their stuff because it just gets all the benefit of this caching stuff for free. I mean, free in quotes, they're paying that, but you know what I mean, right? They don't, they don't have to change any of your application code to get all these benefits. And this is why SQL is, is, a, is a, in relational model, is a brilliant idea. Um, and that's why people pay a lot of money for this, okay? All right, let's give Moshe a round of applause. Okay. Again, homework four is due Sunday, and I'll see everyone on, on Monday, okay? Moshe, thank you so much. That was awesome. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as a skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Records still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives.